All right, welcome to Frankenstein House. <laughs> this is Greg Alexander. I'm here with Bon. Uh, we are going to be talking. Uh, we are going to be talking the Killing Joke uh, by by Brian Bolland and Alan Moore. Um, uh, before we uh, get started with the with the comic, though, how are you doing today, Bon? <laughs> I'm doing all right. You know, just. Enjoying life in quarantine and uh, <laughs> just packing. That's all we've been doing is just slowly packing and getting stuff ready to move. Yeah, understood. That's uh, definitely a uh, that's a lot. So you're you're moving into the city in the midst of <laughs> uh, quote unquote the event. The event, yeah. The unnamed event. We are not allowed to mention the name <laughs> of West. Uh, we we can't actually monetize these streams at all yet, but um, the fact that we are the fact that we would are talk would be talking about the event could in the future stop us from monetizing it. So there is a thing that's happening in the world right now. We're not allowed to say what it is, but it's definitely making us not leave. <laughs> not allowed to go outdoors. No, not really. not at all. Uh, my partner just bought us. Um, masks that I guess a uh, fashion designer friend of theirs is uh, selling now because I guess a lot of fashion designers have just been, you know, switching <laughs> to uh, yeah. an all mask inventory. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so I'm going to get one with skulls on it. <laughs> Ooh, I need, we need to get some. I think we just bought some bandanas and stuff to convert. So that's awesome. I really just wanted to take this time, you know, with this event going on to really get full stalker mode you know just get the mask get the outfit learn some broken russian we'll do it oh i mean i i being <laughs> married to a russian i'm trying to learn broken <laughs> russian right now i'm very bad at it but the duolingo owl tells me i'm doing a really good job so i think you'll be the one taking point <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh i my only my only complaint is the the CDC has not given any guidelines of uh, like cyber goth masks, like the 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 fake gas masks. Like I I would imagine, be all about some cyber goth. Masks. all of those people that like spent that ridiculous <laughs> amount of money for a subgenre to dress up as, and to be I don't know some places they get mocked, but I mean I guess who's fucking laughing now? <laughs> they have like these walls of like my time has come. These yeah, they're they're, they're like the, the gas mask. This will yeah, get us through. <laughs> they're the doomsday preppers of the music scene. They was like, yeah, we, you know, our our limbs are limber because we've been doing all the 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 spin moves and the the karate chops and the invisible visible ninja fights, and now also our masks work. <laughs> and I mean, to be honest, I'm sure that style of music will be the soundtrack of the apocalypse. So. Hope you guys are ready for some fucking zero mancer for a while. Yeah, combi Christ is <laughs> the most relevant that they have ever been. <laughs> fucking combi Christ. <laughs> we were uh, talking earlier uh, this People week, still uh, <laughs> my partner and I, and uh, we were just talking about uh, yeah, Andy. Uh, I think that, that guy's name is Andy Laplague La or something like that, and something has, like that. Yeah, he has another project called Icon of Coil, and we're just like very much like. Why did he choose Combi Christ? Because Icon of Coil, uh, Icon of Coil is a much better <laughs> band. It's like, just like goofy synth pop, and it's kind of beautifully pure in its goofy synth popness. Well, probably similar to why Jorgensen doesn't like talking about the synth pop era of Ministry. They thought it'd probably be cooler to make, you know, whatever the fuck Combi Christ does. Yeah, I mean they change up pretty. Yeah. <laughs> what are they metal now? They're like yeah, they're in sort of like in, imagine if you played. Uh, we have Ben Rowe in the chat saying I can coil is pretty sweet. I, I you know I agree with you, sir. <laughs> um, yeah, they uh, some ministry actually on their last on their there was like a whack there was a tour I think for. Uh, because there was a Wax Tracks documentary made recently. Yeah. And uh, there was a tour uh, showing it that I guess Ministry were doing acoustic shows out of. And they were playing stuff like Every Day is Halloween. Oh, um, shit. And I think that um, I think Paul Barker has been working with them again. So 
I don't know. I don't know where when anything is going because apparently there's been some uh, some bad stuff popping up about somebody in the ministry entourage uh, yeah. having done bad things that are also you know could potentially demonetize our videos. We can't um, talk about the event. We can't talk about the no no things. Yeah, yeah. But the uh, reason I can't see chat, I don't know why. It's like, no, really. You've been, well, the way it's said, it's like. I could see like a court like that much of it. So it's weird. I'm sure. curious what's going on with my webpage. Might have so, to refresh. You might lose me for like two seconds. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Uh, so Courtney is saying Oh. Now it's now it's the Greg show. <laughs> so now I'm gonna tell you about feral hawks. Uh, and that, see, that sounds like it might be uh, a meme, but uh, actually it is not a meme because we have feral hogs invading Canada. They are building pigloos as they go. Hold on, Bob's back. I'm gonna re-add him. Fucking hey, oh, still not doing it. Hold on, give me a second. Let me let me try right. let me try some things. Well, fuck. I guess I just don't get to see chat. <laughs> yeah, are you um like are is your screen maximized? Uh, it can be. No, um, it's not. Uh, that might be it. That mine, it has it all the way in the far right hand side of the page. Well, it's on the far right, but now I can only see like a quarter of it. I don't think I can even chat. Let me all see. Right. Uh, we'll figure this out in a second. Yeah. What the fuck? All right, whatever. All right. All right, so back to hog chat. Uh, so yeah, they are building hig, uh, pigloos. Uh, they're in the uh, wild Canadian yonder. <laughs> While not. you're gone, I'm uh, I'm doing uh, I'm, I'm I'm giving the update on uh, the current current feral hog status of uh, North oh, America. Sure. Oh yeah, how's that going? Uh, so basically everything we've ever made a joke meme not taking seriously is in fact real and is going to kill us from uh, the event to uh, feral hogs. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, the uh, the pigs have some pig loose. Pig loose? <laughs> Holy shit. They are wreaking havoc across uh, wide swaths of Canada. They are uh, wild boars who which have interbred with domestic pigs. Which I'm sure just makes them stronger. Uh, yeah, so we have. Let me just uh, see if I can zoom in on this uh, important graph here. So from 1990 to 2000, we had a little bit of infestation into Canada over here. Uh, from 2001 to 2010, we had a lot of infestation, and now it's just kind of going crazy. So they're very. Uh, very uh, strong, resilient creatures, these uh, feral pigs. They're also kind of adorable, but apparently they will kill you and your family, uh, and that's why we must have guns. I mean, that's obvious why we should have guns. I mean, <laughs> you don't think that's why we should have guns? Uh, that's sort of the should... only reason. <laughs> it's basically just feral hogs at this point. Not in Trump's America. Jesus. <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is, the guy got elected, feral hogs invade. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. That is true. Uh, so uh, Benjamin Rowe in the chat was saying, Wax Tracks has in the KMFDM label. Yes, actually. Uh, so Wax Tracks uh, was a Chicago label. I think they were from the mid-'80s through to the early 2000s. So they had everything from KMFDM to ministry. To, uh, sort of they were the... Uh, like the kind of an epicenter of American yeah. industrial music and EBM music. Uh, I know that they had a contentious relationship with Chicago, Chicago being sort of a, a techno uh, city for a long time. Uh, but yeah, so there was a documentary made about Wax Tracks that they're, uh, they've been doing a tour of. I don't know if it's out yet. I think this would kind of be the perfect situation to uh, release yeah. that. I remember seeing it. I wanted to get it because of when they were doing the documentary to the uh, the wax track, like the entire ministry thing with all the early years, the wax track years of it. 
-hmm. And I remember that being released kind of when that documentary was announced. I've been meaning to get that because I really want the older ministry on five. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Like Revenge is, I think, like the best ministry song. Like I Revenge mean. is a, an amazing song. Oh, Benjamin's, yeah. Yeah, Benjamin Rowe has corrected me. Chicago was house, Detroit was techno. Uh, Chicago, you're absolutely right. Um, Nothing good comes out of Detroit. Oh, Robocop. I mean, Robocop, <laughs> many automobiles, uh, the insane clown posse. Uh, <laughs> I have such like a, I have such like a weird relationship with that band because like oh, I feel God. like. <laughs> Gen I, I feel like generally positive about them aside from the fact that I grew up in Florida and like kind of half of like every terrible thing that happened to me as an adolescent seemed to have a juggalo involved. So. I mean, when the worst things in life happen, there's usually a juggalo behind it. I'm mean, usually, usually, I mean, uh, so is that why, uh, uh, maybe that's why the FBI has my little lit. Oh, ICP is an abomination. I, I wouldn't say that. I think they're, uh, a, I don't know. I think they're sort of a gimmick rap group that got a little too big for what they were supposed to be. It's not sort of like if Digital Underground had a cult. <laughs> like if Humpty Hump was a cult leader, that would be like It would like, be what? better though. It would be way better. <laughs> because at least, at least those guys wouldn't have turned around like, oh shit, we're big. Let's, let's. Let's flip the script. Let's let's say our all of our albums had a religious message behind them, and I'm like, yeah. no, it fucking did it. <laughs> Not at all. Like I just remember, like at a friend of mine trying to convince me of that. No, you see, you put all the albums together, and they tell you how to get the Fago or Fago. I don't know where where they, they get you somewhere, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, no, it doesn't. Like, yeah, they like church be strong. You hear that? They said that. That's part of the whole like religious man i'm like no it's fucking not <laughs> you, the way you listen to these guys' lyrics they're not writing some fucking like mystical fucking gateway to some new fucking realm that you can get to just by putting them all together or they have some sort of religious message behind it it's just a bunch of dudes that you know pretty much was like fuck well <laughs> you know let's sell some more records yeah and you know sometimes that's what you gotta do they should really just you know, rebrand, you know, the Frankenstein house bit to just like comics with a big fucking music intro where we talk about music for an hour and, <laughs> <laughs> and then well, we'll talk about the comic. I mean, that's kind of what I wanted this to be. Yeah. It's sort of, uh, we'll, 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 we will talk about the comic and there is going to be a we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to there. Um, so yeah. One of the things the chat's talking about is, they said it was about Jesus, but how do you explain the dating game? Actually, that was uh, going to be one of my examples. Of it. <laughs> well, I, just, I just remember the dude just like just convinced, you know, that whole meme of Charlie and the wall, like conspiracy theories. It was like that, just like to say he'd stop stuff, like right there, right there. Do you hear it? I'm like, dude, he just said like fuck that bitch like three times. But if you hear the subtext, Jesus is there, and I'm like. Where? I don't know. It's probably the worst person trying to defend whatever was happening there, but I used to remember that pretty vividly whenever. <laughs> so, um, actually, that I, I got I, I got a transition. I got a transition. Oh, oh. Um, so, the secret of uh, Insane Clown Posse being secretly a, uh, a, a giant, I guess, Allegory for Jesus, the Dark Carnival being a. Uh, you can Google this. Um, we're going to move on to Alan Moore, whose uh, dedication to the uh, imaginary puppet snake god named Glycon. Um, <laughs> My new guy. Uh, it's quite comparable. So, is there a picture uh, of it you can share? Just a picture of. Or is it like, you know, some god's. That you can't show pictures of because you know. Yeah, hold on, I'm 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 doing something here. Okay, so this is probably a fucking ferret. Yeah, it's. <laughs> Wait, is that it? Yeah, so this is uh this is a picture of uh glycon. So in, I want to say probably the. 
I would say probably post, probably maybe like slightly pre-Christianity, uh, Glycon showed up. Uh, so there was a lot of, uh, in, in the later days of the Roman Empire, there was a lot of, um, I guess, like cargo cults popping up. Car uh, cargo cults kind of being like, um, you know, cults on the road and uh, it just kind of, it was a lot of like traveling magicians and preachers and people trying to drum up support for their particular imaginary gods. And one of which was the most, uh, the most imaginary god was this one called Glycon, which a... Uh, Glycon. Glycon. What's the of Zoltan? Zoltan. Oh, God. <laughs> we might have to do an episode of this based off of Dude, Where's My Car? Because that's... <laughs> Zoltan. <laughs> Zoltan. <laughs> uh, but uh, so Glycon was literally a god... Uh, represented by a sock puppet that a that a, a man would wander around and talk about the power of glycon and this is the the, the emissary of glycon it was a sock puppet so, yeah. <laughs> so when Alan Moore decided uh, so he had a whole story about it. it's like on, on my 40th birthday <laughs> I got very drunk at a biker bar <laughs> which all good stories start with that when I was 40 years old I got very drunk at a biker bar and I told everybody there that I was going to become a magician. And so his whole thing ended up being, um, he got, you know, he woke up with a hangover the next day. He realized what he had told everybody and he had decided, and then he decided, well, since I told everybody, I'm going to have to do it. <laughs> so um, he decided to uh, look into like what the history of myth mythological gods and find a god to worship. And he found Glycon, who is an imaginary snake god that uh, was just a, a, a hen puppet on some, you know, grifter's, uh, you know, in some grifter's cart in, you know, somewhere in the, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of the Roman Empire. And it was like, okay, the fake god, I'm taking the fake god. And so he decided to he decided to become so he's now a pagan magician guy who does uh, who, his patron god is now Glycon. Um, so oh, yeah. that's uh, that that is the writer of the comic that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the artist of uh, the comic is uh, a less weird but still kind of strange guy by the name of Brian Bolland, who is actually kind of a brilliant artist. He's best known now for being uh, mostly a covers artist, uh, but he's done everything from interiors, uh, interiors inking. Uh, he is now a, a colorist as well uh, since uh, he's, I think in his late fifties and he's now converted to completely digital. Like he's managed to keep up with the, the ebb and flow of the industry. And he's uh, kind of inspiring being like, you know, you find your, you know, your sort of artists from that era, like people like Neil Adams, like they still work the same way, but Brian Bolland has adjusted over time. Uh, and one of the things that I, I'm going to talk about when we get a little bit more into the comic is uh, some of the changes that he has made to the comic over time. Uh, so Batman, The Killing Joke, was released in 1988, uh, and it has had a couple of different versions over the years. Um, well, um, do you want to just uh, start getting into uh, the comic book itself? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I'll, I, I did a little uh, summary of the, the plot. Ooh. We can talk about things as they go. Uh, so um, Killing Joke starts off with Batman. He's visiting Joker in Arkham Asylum. Uh, he is effectively trying to convince the Joker uh, to, uh, you know, can we talk? Because one of us, at the end of this, one of us is going to kill the other one. Is there a way that we can stop this this madness before it gets too crazy? Um, Joker is dealing cards. Uh, I, I don't know if he's trying to play, uh, you know, three-card Monty or something. I should probably have looked that up, but oh well. <laughs> um, Batman attempts to get his attention. Uh, Joker is just dealing cards, dealing cards, dealing cards. Batman grabs his wrist pulling back the makeup on his hand, revealing that that is not actually the Joker. That is some stand-in who kind of looks like the Joker. And um, the, the Joker escaped Arkham Asylum sometime before. 
Meanwhile, the Joker is somewhere completely, uh, completely different. He is somewhere on the out outskirts of Gotham. He is currently purchasing an abandoned amusement park from its owner. Um, and this brings us to a uh, flashback. So the flashbacks in this are kind of interesting because uh, there's some dialogue at the end of the comic book which suggests mm -hmm. that maybe this whole thing is complete nonsense. Like, com it could be complete horseshit. Um, but the flashback to the Joker, pre the Joker, uh, reveal him to be a uh, failing comedian. He has a wife and a young child. Uh, they are s struggling a great deal to make ends meet. He was employed by a chemical plant uh, sometime early on in his, uh, in his life, but he uh, quit that job to try to make it as a comedian and seems to be failing horribly. Um, what do you think of this as... An origin for the Joker. Like, have you? Did you see the the recent movie they made? I did. Okay, so um, the so the Joker is failed it. comedian. Uh, how do you like that as a as a possible origin? <laughs> I mean, it could make sense. I mean, it's it's really funny about the whole origin thing. I kind of because um, I went through when I read the comic recently. There's like I have the deluxe, so it has all the extra stuff and how they talked about how they originally didn't want they didn't. They didn't want to have a Joker origin story just because, you know, they kept wanting to have that, un, you know, that mystery behind it. You know, yeah. they could have done without it. But, I mean, it wasn't too bad of a Joker origin story. I don't know about the whole <laughs> failed comedian thing, especially with the new movie. They kind of, I don't know. I don't know if it's a bit cheesy, but, I mean. Yeah, but, that's, that's interesting because there was the um, – when so Alan Moore also wrote Watchmen that had the character of a comedian mm -hmm. that you kind of don't really understand the na the name of the comedian uh, aside from this whole thing of like life is the joke or something yeah except when you when you get to the flashback of him and in the flash like in the flashback to his sort of like his first run as a uh, as a superhero he's actually wearing like a modified clown costume it isn't until later on that he gets like the the all the gear and the the shoulder pads and stuff. So I don't know if it's like a, a thing that Ellen Moore has about um, comedy characters or clowns gone bad or anything like that. I, I don't know if that's a, a recurring idea that he was exploring at the time or anything like that. But um, yeah, it's, I thought it was interesting as kind of a concept, especially giving sort of a semi you know uh, sort of a set uh, you know sort of relatable almost um mm -hmm. depiction of what he could have been before he was the joker it's definitely different from the movie because in the movie he's you know from various like physical uh the physical abuse brought upon mm -hmm. him by his mom and just the the you know the the mental health issues from being you know poor and then in New York in the 1970s, I, uh, I think that um, sort of the physical and the environmental stress um, were very different. Like they, they created a very different character than the one that we see in The Killing Joke. Um, the guy in The Killing Joke seems, you know, kind of a nevish, but he's also very, I don't know, he, he seems to have his, his shit together a lot more than Arthur Fleck in the movie. So I was, it was it's interesting because this is cited as an inspiration for that. So, yeah, it, like thinking about that too is you know how basically Joker and this origin story and the killing joke was just a normal dude just wanted to be a comedian, wife, kid on the way kind of a thing. Um, he didn't have, I mean, anything that alludes in the flashbacks we get, no, no allusion to any sort of like mental disorder or anything, kind of like what the Arthur Fleck went. So, yeah, and the, the whole with both of those, the movie and the comic, we're kind of trying to like, you know, oh, you have a bad day and you can mm -hmm. become a villain. But I find it, it's a lot more, I think the point comes across more when it's just a normal everyday person that can snap. Whereas yeah. the, the Joker, the new movie where they focused a little bit more on like the mental health issues and stuff, you know, it kind of felt like it was already leaning towards that way. You know, it's kind of the way they were painting him in that. Whereas, 
And the, you know, again, with the origin and this one, it was just kind of, I'm a normal everyday dude. Oh, I'm falling behind on money. I'm going to like, you know, do this heist. Oh no, I fell in a vat of acid and now I'm crazy. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah I think that was, that is one of the things that they, you know, with the Joker movie, you can see like, it was almost like predestined that this guy yeah. was going to do something bad. Uh, whereas like in this, it's, yeah, some guy down on his luck has one bad day and, uh, becomes the Joker. It's it's interesting to see. Uh, we'll get into it as we go along yeah. because uh, he tries to kind of enact this same thing upon one of the characters in the story, and we'll see how it uh, how it unfolds. Uh, so we flash forward back to the amusement park. Uh, the Joker murders the owner of the amusement park with uh, the Joker poison, which become which I don't know if it's so much now but definitely was at the time like a, a kind of a long starting a long-standing trademark of the joker mm -hmm. i've seen it a little bit in um modern times um in scott snyder's run the idea of the poison that turns you either um it kills you and it gives you the big rictus grin mm -hmm. or it or it doesn't kill you but it turns you effectively into a joker zombie version of yourself and it's uh it, it's one of those things that i think it i you saw versions of this really early on i think one of the one of the most like infamous early joker stories was the joker fish uh story <laughs> which i don't know if you ever read that i don't but, think i read the joker fish one no so it was the idea that so the joker poured a bunch of this chemical into gotham harbor that turned all the fish uh, gave all the fish big rictus grins. Like, it didn't kill them, it just gave them these big rictus grins. And then, because this is, like, pre, like, the dark times of comics, this is pre, like, the dark era, <laughs> um, instead of it being, like, part of some, like, horrible murder scheme, the Joker's next move was to try to uh, file a trademark in open court for <laughs> the fish because he created the fish. <laughs> <laughs> doing it joker it's really sticking it to gotham there <laughs> uh, and that's uh, uh, that's kind of one of the one of the things that I, it definitely didn't start with a killing joke but it came yeah. uh the killing joke is sort of like one of the first like major like happenings in it was this transition from the joker and like, other villains of the same you know the of, of sort of the same vintage going from being a bit more like goofy and wacky and transforming into more um, scary. Like you're you're seeing a guy who is going to try to like drop Batman and Robin into like a giant coffee cup <laughs> to like a guy who is, uh, I mean, the Joker is kind of more um, John Doe from Seven now. It's, yeah. And seeing that transition is interesting. There's uh, there's a comic book series actually. The, the the current Batman comic right now seems to be trying to like write a reason for that happening, in which the uh, the Joker met up with a supervillain, uh, another supervillain called the Designer, who like his gimmick is he can talk to another supervillain and he can talk them through like give me your greatest plan and I will point out all like all the problems with it and I will help you become the great, you know, I will help you become the greatest villain. And so like the Joker tells this guy his greatest plan. And unfortunately this, you know, the Joker's ability to adapt to new situations allows the joke, uh, uh, causes the designer to effectively mold him into this, super hardcore uh, murder supervillain instead of you know, being the guy who like, oh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to tie you to this, uh, this roller coaster. And Ooh. yeah. And now it's like, oh, I'm going to cut off your mother's face and I'm going to wear it on my ass. <laughs> uh, I haven't read that comic yet, but damn. no, but it's out there. I'm sure. Uh, probably the, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, back to the story. Um, Batman and Alfred uh, ruminate on why he and the Joker hate each other so much, despite neither one not knowing so much about the other. 
Um, the Joker later on reveals like he's sure that Batman had one bad day, just like him. But he gives all these different possibilities of like what might have happened to Batman. So it's obvious like the Joker doesn't know who Batman is. Meanwhile, Batman doesn't really know who the Joker is either. Um, we flash over to Commissioner Gordon and Barbara, uh, Barbara Gordon. Uh, Barbara Gordon was at the time, I think, retired from being Batgirl. Uh, she started off... Um, In this part, yeah, because the movie added a really, really unneeded intro, which kind of tried to explain what she was doing before this as Batgirl, and then she just kind of retired as Batgirl. And okay. it was... Uh, I don't know. The comic doesn't explain it too much, but at this point, she is uh, retired as Batgirl. Okay. Yeah. So I, I didn't end up watching the movie. So um, can you, oh, for any, oh. for the rest of us who didn't end up watching the animated movie, can you give us like a little rundown of uh, what that early part is? So basically, the animated movie, um, for most part, is just like the comic. The only difference is, is that they um, change a couple little things, but it's like this bigger intro. And the reason why they did a bigger intro is um, because coming up here with um, Barbara Gordon and what happens to her and stuff like that, um, back in the day, um, it was a big issue because a lot of people out there would complain that they thought Barbara Gordon was just a plot device. Okay. And that, that's all she was used for is a plot device in this comic because of all the stuff that happens to her because it was easy just to you know, do that to a girl. You know, super old, it's kind of a shock thing. But it's really just for Batman, and you know, at some point, even Alan Moore was like, "I, yeah, we should have probably done it a lot better." You know, I kind of, you know, kind of regrets doing it the way they did it. Yeah. So the movie <laughs> to try to fix that thought it would t try to better explain, give Barbara more time. That's the reason why they did this to give Barbara more time to establish her character a lot more. So it doesn't seem like the first time you see her in the comics that this shit happens to her. Yeah. But um, in the movie. You know, they go into her character a little bit more. Um, you see her talking to a friend of hers about a guy she's seeing and stuff and kind of venting and stuff. And you get this really, like, um, dad-daughter vibe from Batman and Batgirl, kind of how you do, like, a lot of the comics and stuff in this show. And then you get to a part where apparently they're fucking sleeping with each other. And, and then it's, like, basically, yeah, basically they're, like, have this weird dynamic of like mentor, mentee, daughter, father kind of a thing. And she's kind of talking about him, referencing not him, but like a boyfriend, but you know, she's talking about Batman and they go into a scene of them just doing it. And, uh, and it just, and it's like, it does a worse job of trying to do that. You know, it's, you know, it sucks that, you know, the writing back then wasn't too focused on, you know, the Barbara element, you know, establishing her character more. They did. They, like I said, they, they said they regretted doing it that way. Yeah. Wasn't his favorite Batman, you know, story. They could have done it better, but like the movie, he takes it and goes, we'll do something. Hold my beer. <laughs> and they fucking don't. They just, they did. I remember seeing it because I saw it in theaters um, when it came out in 2016. I saw it the two nights only in one of the theaters here in town. I went and saw it with a bunch of friends and, uh, I just remember seeing that part. I'm like, I'm watching. I'm like, I am a hundred and ten percent fucking positive this didn't happen in the comics. In fact, when I go home, I have to like read it again. So I'm like, I'm. I, it's been a while, but I don't remember this happening. And I go look at the comic. Sure enough, because it just doesn't. It starts with him going to the prison and or the Arkham Asylum. And nope. And so it's just the movies. It's not bad. The movies good. You get Mark Hamill. You got Kevin Conroy. You got. Um, you know, everybody that's supposed to be there, there, but it's just, they add that unnecessary part to appease the fans and stuff that are upset about it, but there would have been a completely way better way to have gone about it. You could have like easily have done all the other parts except for them boinking each other, which was fucking weird. <laughs> yeah. That's a very odd way of doing it. I think it that, is. you know, I, at that point, I think in the 19, yeah, I think in 1988, all of that, Barbara had retired as Batgirl. I don't mm -hmm. think they had, there had ever been any kind of uh, Batman, Batgirl romance. I think that actually the romance was uh, Batgirl and, uh, and um, first Robin. Yeah. And Dick Grayson. Dick think, Grayson. Yeah. Yeah. Because and they I, had a thing a while in Batman beyond in the comics where the reason why in the show, 
the comics were two years after the show. And the reason why on the show you never saw Dick Grayson is because in the comics it's revealed that while Barbara was, this is the only time it's ever been referenced, but while Barbara was with Dick Grayson, Batman and her slept together and knocked her up. Oh, okay. So, so yeah, so that's like the only time, you know, I've really seen anywhere reference any sort of relationship between those two. And most comics, especially at that point, there was nothing. So for the show to do it was just a, or the movie to do it was just a fucking curveball. <laughs> you were watching it last night. I watched it last night before this. I was like, yep, still fucking weird. <laughs> yeah, that's just a weird addition to this story. I mean, this, so, all right. Well, I guess we'll, we'll get into this. This story is, uh, has a reputation for being extremely problematic. And I think a lot of it is deserved and some of it is a little kind of, you know, over the top reaction to it. But I think like the concept of what happens to Barbara in this story is it's, it's extremely fucked up. And I like, and Alan Moore has like actually gone ahead and like apologized for his, oh, yeah. um, for writing this. Like he's compared writing the killing joke to as if I took, I think it's it, the phrase was like, if I took Casper the friendly ghost and I gave him a basket full of human eyeballs, like <laughs> he, did, yeah, he definitely apologized for it. Cause he felt, you know, felt like it was one of the worst stories and he felt yeah. bad with how they wrote it all up. But I mean, and there's a lot of speculations, which you see a lot of what really happened to Barbara. And I mean, the comics were pretty good about it. Even the comics, when I was reading an interview kind of with them about the movie and then um, the writer, they were just like, I'm pretty fucking sure there's nowhere in the comics. I alluded to um, Joker doing anything more than the photos or, yeah. uh, or her and Batman have a relationship. There was, um, there's a scene in the movie. There's another thing they don't add in the comics. The scene in the movie where um, Batman's trying to find Joker. So he's going like everywhere. He's, he's going to some brothels and stuff, holding up his picture and, you know, these prostitutes were like, oh, he always comes around here when he first gets out, but he hasn't been around here. He must have found someone else. And so as part of that, um, people were like, look, did he, like, you know, do something more with Barbara? And, like, they were saying, like, no. Like, when one of the writers for the movie were, were also like, that's not how we wrote it to come off that way. But, you know, if it did, it, that's not what happened. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, like, read the comics and stuff, and, you know, there's nothing uh, – in there about him doing more than the photos, but it, the movie really kind of not only do they add the the Batman and you know bad girl scene with them messing around sleeping together, then they start implying that the Joker's doing shit too. So there's just a few things with the movie that I just it's cool to see you know all the greats together doing it, but at the same time it's whoever they let fucking write it needs to yeah <laughs> you know, do that ever again. <laughs> it's fucking terrible. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of weird additions. Uh, some of the adaptations have been great, and some of them kind of not. Like I love like All Star Superman. I thought it was a great adaptation, but then there's other stuff like I didn't really like the Court of Owls uh, animated version and oh, yeah. stuff like that. Uh, so we'll get back to the story here. So uh, Commissioner Gordon and Barbara ruminating on the Joker as well and his escape. Um, so the Joker shows up at uh, Gordon's uh, place and uh, shoots Barbara in the stomach. Um, after that, he uh, kidnaps Gordon um, and then ends up photographing Barbara with all of her clothes removed, which is... Pretty much the, uh, yeah, that's that's sort of where uh, a lot of the kind of genuine, you know, the, the kind of where, where people get genuinely upset at the story about. Yeah. Uh, because it kind of, it's one of those things that uh, if if they were at thinking more creatively, they could have done this a very different way uh, without there yeah. being uh, overtones of uh, all of this attached to yeah. it. But, um but unfortunately, they didn't. They didn't. So that's uh, now part of the history of uh, the history of the story. Well, that's kind of why, um, like I said, a lot of people were upset with her just because it was just at this point she was only used as like a plot device to like drive a lot of this story with no no real justice or nothing really done for the character. I mean, she doesn't 
I don't think she has a lot of lines in the comic either. It's just basically she's in there, this happens to her, and that's kind of it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I will say that in this scene, um, before the you know, before the bad things happen, like Barbara's hair is like the most nineteen eighty eight hair I have ever seen. <laughs> like her hair and like the hair and the glasses are like that is a time capsule of fashion. Oh um, right. So uh, <laughs> moving on, uh, we now will go back to another flashback. Um, the man who might be the Joker is now drinking with some gangsters. Uh, they take advantage of the fact that he used to work for the, Ac I think it's the, is it the Ace or the Acme chemical plant? I think it's Ace. Ace chemical, yeah, yeah. Ace chemical sounds right. They talk him into being part of their scheme, which was uh, the Red Hood. So this was um, based off of an early Batman story where they were trying to figure out like who is the who is the Joker and Batman's theory was he was a villain that he beat early on into, into his career called the Red Hood who was a, a mobster who wore a giant metal red helmet uh, and a cape and ran around uh, <laughs> ran around doing crimes along with a. Uh, a along with a team of mobsters. So he, ch he chases them through the acne chemical plant. Uh, he uh, takes down a bunch of mobsters. The Red Hood himself uh, tries to escape and he kicks him into, uh, he kick ends up accidentally, I think accidentally kicking him into a vat of chemicals. So he thinks that potentially this person he kicked into a vat of chemicals ended up getting mutilated by those chemicals and is now the Joker, but he's not sure. And this kind of adds a little bit more, this story adds a little bit more credence to that earlier story of, well, the Joker almost definitely is the Red Hood and here's why he is the Red Hood. So the idea that the, the mobsters have is that in order to protect the anonymity of their actual boss, uh, they have their boss always do all of his uh, business under the, uh, the Red Hood helmet. And then whenever somebody actually has to do something in the field, they get some stooge to wear it instead. So uh, the Joker, uh, because he used to work at this chemical plant, is the perfect person to have because he knows where all the security guards are going to be, where every alarm is going to be. You know, he knows, you know, he knows every uh, way into, you know, every secret passage, every easy access point into the chemical plant. So they effectively hire him to guide them through the Joker doing this because, you know, Comedy career isn't panning out, so you may as well help, help some mobsters rob. rob. Now I know what to do. If my stand-up doesn't work out, <laughs> got to find me some mobsters. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of – honestly, uh, there's a lot of Seattle uh, stand-up comedians I know who probably would do shit like this. I mean, why not? You get to wear a bitch and, you know, metal hood thing, so. Yeah. And – uh Get some money, but apparently that's not what happened to him. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's some drawbacks to this plan, unfortunately. Yeah, there's quite a quite a lot of drawbacks to this plan. <laughs> it wasn't very well thought out. So uh, back in the present, Batman and Harvey Bullock, who I thought was actually not a character this old. I thought he was introduced in the uh, animated mm -hmm. series, but uh, no, uh -huh. he is actually a much longer last, uh, longer lived. Uh, Batman character. I was looking into it. I think it was, I think somewhere in like 1983 or 1984, Harvey Bullock was added to the the cast. Initially, he was a uh, corrupt cop, and then they kind of rehabilitated him a bit to make him just kind of an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because, you know, the movie, they got Bruce Tam to do it all. So it's like the Harvey Bullock from like the animated series is the one who is in the movie. And yeah. stuff. so I'm like, that's fucking cool. Cause you're looking at the comics. And I'm just like, what the do do the so different in the comics? But not even close. He looks kind of like a crackhead, actually. <laughs> he kind of does. Like the pictures of him, he looks just like definitely this alcoholic crackhead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was almost like um, he always had like a schlub kind of demeanor to him. Um, one of the most interesting depictions of him was a, there was a series of graphic novels called uh dc earth one which um 
had uh, they had like a, a Batman one, a Superman one. They recently had like a Green Lantern and a Wonder Woman uh, version of it. But um, the Batman, the Batman one had an interesting version of uh, Harvey Bullock, where they they basically introduce him as a, uh, a kind of a fresh faced detective. I guess he like he comes from like a initially like a reality TV background, like he's a reality TV detective who like his show got canceled and because of the, the fallout from the show, he got reassigned to Gotham. So he shows up and he's like fresh faced and he's like in great shape and he's <laughs> kind of handsome. And they've talked about like the plan for these, this series of graphic novels is to show the downfall of Harvey Bullock and just see him just getting like, like, start drinking every night and just like, yeah, I got, I'm doing, oh, it's falafel for dinner again. Ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It's, yes. I'd probably read that though. I'd read, I'd probably read a comic about Harvey Bullock just, you know, uh, steak it. out at steak and shake. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> They're visiting Barbara. She is uh, crippled. Um, so that's an interesting thing, too. So initially, apparently, so uh, there's been some conflicting talk about this. So this might might not have been the official thing. And I will, uh, you know, I'll cop to this if I, if I find out that it wasn't the case. But I've heard this from a couple different sources now. The killing joke was not supposed to be continuity. Like, it was not supposed to be a... Uh, an incontinuity Batman story. It was supposed to be its own like standalone little thing about like Batman and the Joker. It wasn't supposed to be the the font from where all stories yeah. for the next thirty years come from. <laughs> this and wasn't supposed to be canon. This wasn't supposed to be canon. <laughs> so apparently, I mean, that was the deal. So like, they go from having this like, well, we don't care about what we do to the characters because none of it really matters like none of it is actually going to happen in the context of this uh, of you know you know if you go back to like batman you know if you buy the batman comic next week that girl's going to be swinging around gotham she's going to be having a great time like none of this actually happens um and i guess the the higher-ups at dc were so enamored with uh with the re the response to this and i guess there was some delays in production and i guess it was just a an editorial decision that was like, no, Batman the Killing Joke is continuity. <laughs> it is what all continuity is going to spring from. So uh, so Barbara Gordon is crippled officially. Um, so they, you know, it took a while. I, I can't remember. I think it was the writer Chuck Dixon who kind of turned her into a hacker character called Oracle later on. Mm -hmm. And had her involved in the Birds of Prey series. I think it was Chuck Dixon. I, I'll look it up. It might have been somebody else. Or at, least, at the very least, Chuck Dixon did a lot of that writing. Um, and then she was picked up as a character by like Gail Simone, who did a lot of uh, did a lot of work with the Birds of Prey, and eventually was a person who wrote her uh, getting, uh, I guess, the, the the surgeries in order to get um, use of her legs back again. Oh, I love um, that no robot legs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> Lieutenant Dan. Where'd you get those bitching robot legs? <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was uh, her actually getting uh, the use of her legs back again was a, a big controversial decision because I feel uh, apparently there, there's a lot of um, you know comic book fans who are disabled and were quite delighted at the uh, the inclusion of this you know this character who uh, was about to go know. a different direction. <laughs> no, comic no, they... comic book fans everywhere got in a huff that they decided to make the <laughs> female lead not cripple anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean yes, but I'm for sure different reasons. <laughs> no, there's a lot of uh, uh, you know, there's not. I don't know. I, I don't know if it's a lot, but it's uh, some some fairly vocal, like disabled comic book fans who thought that you know, the idea that there's a uh, there's a, there's a, a comic book uh, you know a comic book super heroine who is um, you know uh, in a wheelchair but still still able to like uh, contribute to the fight of being a being. You know, in you know, fighting crime and protecting the innocents, and be you know, 
it was uh, you know it was great representation. It was great. Uh, it was great as far as um, you know being a, a positive role model for people who might be in wheelchairs or you know might find themselves in wheelchairs. And they they were very upset. They're like, oh yeah, magic surgery, fix spine, make problem go away. Uh, With my handy dandy doctor plot device. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's it's difficult when you live in you know the DC universe, which has like wow. literal gods flying around, and you know people with you know <laughs> if if you're like if your character is close friends with like a new god who has a mother box who can heal any injury with a push of a button, like it yeah. is kind of odd that a character would still be wheelchair bound. But as far as like its meaning in the real world, it's kind of cool to have you know somebody who is disabled but is still able to contribute in uh a meaning a, an incredibly meaningful way into this you know this storyline as long as there's no stairs or carpet yeah or oh god there was an there was a, a book called ultimate x-men that had mr uh, there was like so it was like alternate universe versions of the x-men they had mr sinister who um and this didn't he was not like the the mr sinister of the 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 main universe, but he was a guy with a, a gem in his forehead and who um, was haunted by the go by uh, the spirit of apocalypse. Um, and like, oh, we found the uh, we 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 found uh, Professor Xavier's uh, greatest weakness: stairs. Stairs. <laughs> stairs. <laughs> Which is both hilarious, but also like I feel kind of bad about myself for finding funny. I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, uh, let me see here. Yeah. So they're uh, visiting Barbara. Barbara is uh, telling them to uh, find her father, make sure he doesn't fall off the uh, the path of uh, good and righteousness. Um, at the amusement park, Jerker's gang um, strip Gordon uh, naked and force him into a roller coaster car. Like straight naked, like this dude is just naked as fuck. <laughs> Wild. They really uh, did not give a shit what they did to Gordon. <laughs> yeah, um, it's one of those things that I think that it had uh, the Barbara Gordon part of this not been a uh, not been such a, a you know such a, mm -hmm. a an attractor of attention, people would be like, "You did what to Commissioner Gordon?" Yeah, there. I thought there was, and I. And I got to find the sources again, but I remember um, I thought I read somewhere that I don't know if it's in, I don't think it's implied in the comic that a lot more happened to Gordon other than what they did to him. Like it got yeah. a little more crazier. <laughs> like so, he was trying to break him. And that's the whole, what the whole thing with Barbara and stuff was trying to break Jim Gordon. But I thought, if I remember, I thought I read somewhere that a lot more happened to him. And that was pretty fucked up. Yeah, that might have uh, that might have ended up getting cut out of the script. They were like, "Okay, we gave you the photos. We're not going to do anything." Yeah, we're not going to do anything else to Jim Gordon. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they basically they were kind of revealed. Joker is trying to drive him mad. Basically, he's trying to do this uh, the same thing to him that was done to the Joker, or at least like what the Joker remembers being done to him. Uh, it's like the idea of like one person who is good, who is uh, honest, who is a positive person has one bad day and they can turn into a monster. And that's effectively what the Joker is trying to do. He's trying to turn Commissioner Gordon, who is, you know, if, I don't know if you read Batman Year One, uh, but it's mm -hmm. like the idea of like the only person on the Gotham PD for years who was incorruptible, who is like on, who's like, that's sort of like the idea of like there's one good cop on the force. Uh, that was Commissioner Gordon uh, or Detective Gordon in Batman Year One, and the idea of like uh, this paragon of you know this paragon of virtue. Uh, let's give him one really bad day. See what happens. Just, yeah, just because the Joker woke up with the case of the fuck around. So let's let's <laughs> see what happens. You know. Well, what would happen? What would you know? What would happen if we just fucked with Gordon so bad that give him a bad enough day to just leave, just break his mind? And uh, 
well, shit, see what happens. <laughs> yeah, so we have another flashback after that. Um, Joker is still hanging out with the mobsters. I think they're still eating shrimp. Uh, and the the cops show up. Uh, the mobsters immediately like are just like, yeah, we don't know who this guy is. <laughs> Uh, but they actually just want Joker. Uh, they, they're there to tell him that his uh, wife and child have died uh, from, I think it was uh, like a short out from a, 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 heat a, a heated blanket or something. A bottle heater. A bottle heater, yeah. yeah she was trying out a bottle heater, and apparently it's short, and I don't know if it electrocuted her or caught her on fire. doesn't really say. It just said it was a horrific accident. Yeah. You know, one in a million, you know. You know, doesn't ever happen, but you know, sucks to be you. It happened to your wife and your yeah. child. Yeah, and uh, in the uh, from that, uh, Joker is like, well, I have no reason to be doing this because I no longer have a wife and a child to be making money for. And the mobsters <laughs> yeah. are very much like, oh no, buddy, oh no, we have a deal. So they're going to force him to go through with uh, putting on the Red Hood costume, putting on the helmet, and running through the uh, ACE chemical plant. Uh, I guess they're robbing it. Um, for good. some reason, we see um, a, one of the women from the Joker's mob hanging out in the background of this. I don't know if you noticed. Did, did you notice this? Oh, on the uh, flashback? On the flashback. See. There's one of the women from, uh, from the Joker's gang in this. And then a guy who looks like Joel Gray from Cabaret, who are just like grinning in the background. Like, I don't fucking see that anywhere. Uh, show yours because I know the deluxe editions. Yeah, let me. Uh, the let me version pull. that you're, uh, you probably are looking at. Yeah, let me pull it up here because I was very. Oh, no, I see it. I see it. I see it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think the order of operation is uh, the order of the order is a little different from your summary to the comic. Yeah, I'm kind of touch on that, but yeah, no, I see it there. Yeah, yeah, where he's like laying on the table with his hand over his head. Yeah, he yeah, just, like, grinning just for no reason. Yeah, um, so yeah, that's kind of. I'm, I'm actually kind of curious if, um, because I know like the Joker initially is uh, the Joker's uh, initially his look was initially based both off of a uh, trading card, which looks like a. Just like a, sorry, not a, a train card, like playing card, like the actual Joker from a playing card deck. Mm -hmm. But also, it is based off of, um, I think the guy's name is Conrad Vate. And he was in a movie called The Man Who Laughs. And let me just pull up a, a photo of this guy. There we go. I'll, uh, Add my screen here. Oh. So, yeah, so like that is what this guy looked like in the movie. So it is very much a lot of the early appearances of the Joker kind of look like that, uh, where he is like a, it's sort of a almost Phantom of the Opera, Man in the Iron Mask kind of situation where he's been mutilated and he just looks like that and he's taking his revenge on the people who did terrible things to him. Uh, so yeah, Conrad Vate as I think he was also in uh, he was the Sonambulist in uh, the, uh, the Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, mm -hmm. same actor. But yeah, they uh, the Joker was initially based off of that and kind of just the look of a uh, uh, Joker from a playing card deck. But uh, there is a guy named Joel Gray. And he is, uh, he was in uh, he's sort of a, a well-loved like stage and screen actor, but he has this kind of strange, almost like um, androgynous kind of look in a movie uh, called Cabaret, which I, uh, I'm a huge fan of the stage play and movie of, but uh, nice. there we go. And I've always wondered if this this is maybe like a later inspiration for some of the looks of the Joker because he's gone through like four or five different iterations, yeah. and I've always kind of wondered if this is maybe another inspiration some people have had um, because it is very um, just like the stark 
white face with the red lips, um, kind of a, I've always kind of wondered that. And I'm, I, I'd be curious if anybody knows any, uh, any artists who have said like their version of the Joker have been, has been inspired by Jill Gray and Cabaret because he was, he said like he basically played this character who is like, so he, he plays the MC of a cabaret in the middle of like the Weimar Republic as like, you know, as like the Third Reich is coming up. And uh, he basically said, like Joel Gray has said, like, I wanted to play this character as the devil himself. So he is like, like he's a collaborator. He is a, a demonic tempter of people. He is... You know, he is trying, like, he's not, like, providing entertainment to people. He is distracting them from the things that are going on around them. And I'm kind of curious if that's ever been an inspiration for anybody when they've been trying to do, um, in, you know, visual interpretations of the Joker. Um, let's see. I don't know if you can hear that in the background. My, uh, <laughs> my cat has been uh, demanding to be let in and be let out 800 <laughs> times during the stream. <laughs> yeah, my cat keeps trying to get out then comes over to me for attention then just chill. <laughs> she's just hanging out right now so uh going on from there uh gordon is pulled through the uh i guess it, it, through the amusement park funhouse as the joker sings him a, a jaunty tune about going mad which they do in the movie and it's park animal so it's amazing yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. I, I'm gonna have to go. I'm gonna have to, to listen to the the movie's version of the Going Mad song because I like the lyrics. The lyrics are all already in the comic, but I'm I'm curious what they sound like set the music. Oh, they're amazing! <laughs> I can find it, send it to you. <laughs> yeah, there's a uh, god. The the most recent Batman Arkham game has uh, another like Joker like song song and dance number, and it's like. Oh God! It's like Barbara Gordon's crippled. And I'm laughing. Jason Todd's dead, and I'm laughing. The <laughs> um, yeah. Let me see here. It's so great, though. It's just—it's so <laughs> fucking good. <laughs> Let's see. Where's that? I go loony. There it is. It's just so good because it's just Mark Hamill. <laughs> it's fucking Mark Hamill here. Hold on. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's, like, it's so good. The, uh, it's, full of care. <laughs> it's, it's so good, man. It's fucking Mark Hamill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got it on the yeah. I got it on yeah. the private chat. There you go. There you go. You can check that out. It's <laughs> watching that because I was like, I had to go back and read the comment. I was like, oh man, I remember him like it looks like he's singing him in the comic. And I'm like, I wonder if like this song's in there. So I went there I, when I was going through the comic earlier, refreshing at the last couple of days, and I'm like because of course, of course there's a song in the comic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Alan Moore writes a lot of a lot of lyrics in his uh writes a lot of lyrics in his uh, stuff. Like he actually, so one of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen books has, um, so it's set during the era and it's based loosely on um, Bertolt Brecht's The Threepenny Opera. Uh, opera. Uh, so like Mac the Knife and Pirate Jenny. Um, right. And so like, uh, because he does like, a, he does a lot of stuff with different characters and this general idea of characters from fiction all being interrelated. Uh, the idea of like Pirate Jenny is actually, uh, so like Pirate Jenny is a uh, descendant of uh, Captain Nemo from uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And, but he wrote his own lyrics to all the, like his own lyrics to all the Bertolt Brecht songs from that opera, which is, <laughs> Yeah, he's. I haven't read any of the uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I remember the movie was terrible. But I yeah, but the, the movie had very little to do with the books too. Yeah, um, the movie was. 
I don't know why someone decided to give Stuart Townsend another opportunity to act, but they fucking like. They, they, I guess the guy just had never saw Queen of the Dam. Was like, what? This guy obviously knows how to act. Trust me, he'll be a <laughs> perfect Dorian Gray. He's really good at playing immortal people. Trust me. <laughs> Worst fucking casting choice. Ever. God. Yeah, he's a guy who John Connery quit acting. <laughs> it was the fucking movie where Sean Connery is like, just to make Sean Connery go, fuck it, I'm done. <laughs> like, yeah, he uh, no, fuck. <laughs> I think he, he came back for one movie. Um, he played, uh, he did a, a, a voice of an anim a CGI animated character called Sir Billy, who is like. An 80-year-old Scotsman who like rides skateboard. Apparently, it's the worst movie ever made. And there's like he was just like, okay, well, you didn't like that one. I'm going back to retirement. You guys don't know fucking art. <laughs> like, oh god, yeah. Um, but yeah, we should definitely do. Uh, we should definitely do League of Extraordinary Gentlemen at some point during this uh, this series because yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there's a lot of really there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Uh, so back at uh, back of the ranch, uh, <laughs> Batman goes on a rampage around Gotham. He's beating up hoods uh, until eventually the Gotham City Police Department put out the bat signal. So this is, I guess, where I'm going to bring up differences between the different versions of this story. Because um, in the two, uh, 1988 version... Um, it was just Batman going around beating up people in bars. I think maybe he shows up at Arkham Asylum and shows like Two Face a photo or something. But um, it was it was just like random people at random bars. In the 2008 version, he um, Brian Bolland, the artist, um, along with changing the coloring, which is the coloring is a thing I'm going to talk about in a, in a little bit, yeah. but. Um, along with changing the coloring, he's he re redrew a few things. One of which was he added in a panel of Batman interrogating the penguin. Yeah. For no reason, just like oh, the penguins here too. I guess the penguin. <laughs> you can, yeah. Kids like the penguin. Because in this uh, edition, isn't it? Kind of shows him like ripping off a poster and shoving some dude's face in it, going to like clubs and stuff like shown bars and stuff and it shows the penguin randomly and the bat signal <laughs> yeah the I, the original version did not have the penguin uh which is very weird i know um with the deluxe edition you see a lot of stuff after the comic and the artist was talking about how while they were really happy that the original like colorist and stuff did it so fast when they released it there were some things he was unhappy about so I guess since he became a colorist, he was able to go through on the new issues and like add some things in that he wanted to add in the color and stuff. <laughs> yeah. So I guess he yeah. wasn't too happy with the coloring. <laughs> yeah, I, I will show you the, the comparisons uh, uh, shortly. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the GCPD put out the bat signal. Uh, they have received a ticket to the amusement park with a personalized invitation for Batman. Ooh. Meanwhile, back at the amusement park, the Joker uh, has made Gordon effectively catatonic because he's been showing him uh, pictures of uh, his now crippled daughter with, um, you know, a bullet hole in her abdomen, apparently. And uh, Gordon is not particularly uh, not particularly thrilled at this, but also the Joker does not seem to be getting the reaction that he wanted. The jerk was hoping that Gordon would be going completely out of his mind, and Gordon is just kind of, you know, catatonic on the floor. Uh, after that, the uh, we jump to a flashback. The mobsters and the Joker break into the chemical plant. Uh, the Joker dressed up as a Red Hood. Uh, apparently, there are new security guards uh, that have been installed since the Joker left. Um, he and the mobsters flee. Uh, they're chased by security. Batman breaks into uh, breaks in there and starts chasing as well. Um, and the Joker, uh, in a you know, while fleeing from Batman, falls into a chemical vat. He then emerges as the Joker we know. And that's uh, a scene that we have seen uh, done in many different movie versions. Now we saw it in uh, the original 
a Tim Burton Batman. We saw it in the Suicide Squad. Well, we saw we we saw the Harley Quinn version of it in the Suicide Squad movie, I think. Mm. And we saw we saw it in uh, the Gotham TV show in the last season. There was uh, the character of uh, I think it's Jeremiah. There was Jerome and Jeremiah. I think it's Jeremiah falls into the uh, the plant at the Ace Chemical uh, or the vat at the Ace Chemical plant. So expecting Gordon to have gone crazy, Joker starts trying to torment him. Uh, Batman drives up in the uh, Batmobile, and I gotta say, like the Batmobile from this era is kind of amazing. It is the the, the, the giant bat face yeah. on the front. I was gonna bring up the giant bat face is fucking awesome. Like, <laughs> I'm like, this should have just been the Batmobile, and that's it. No matter what, like every movie, you gotta have the bat face on it. Every <laughs> fucking movie, it doesn't matter. That's another thing. Like uh, early, early Joker, he used to drive around in a car with his own face on the hood. Like, yeah. Uh, why? Why do they not do that anymore? We did. We need. We need more superheroes and supervillains who will just make a car shaped like their face. We can't have nice things. That's why. Back in the day, where supervillains were supervillains, <laughs> and they'd put their fucking faces on their car. That's <laughs> why. Uh, so. Uh, yeah. So Batman uh, drives up. He uh, launches himself from the Batmobile. Um, and attacks Joker and Joker's gang while replaying the conversation that they had at the beginning in the book. They have uh, kind of a repeated uh, motif of Batman's monologue of being, you know, we have to stop doing this. We have to stop fighting each other. At some point, you know, one of us is going to kill the other. Is there some way that we can make this stop happening? Um, Joker sprays acid at him from a trick flower and then runs into the funhouse. Uh, Batman, seeing uh, an opportunity to save Go Gordon, opens up the cage that they're keeping him in, and Gordon tells him to take him down, but take him down by the book. By the book, Batman. Yes, my daughter was violated, and yes, I was stripped naked and huddled through down <laughs> this apartment, that uh, this music car that obviously isn't OSHA, it's OSHA standard. But get him by yeah. the book, for the love of God. Read him his goddamn rights before you take him down. Mirandize him. Yeah, I mean that's up at the back of his head. <laughs> yeah, and it's just I do like the the notion of you know Gordon, you know G Gordon proving he is not you know he has not been taken by the uh, the treatment by the Joker by saying you bring him down, but you bring him down, you bring him down our way. You see, just an alternate reality, Gordon, just like dude, bust a cap in his ass. Dude. I don't give a shit. <laughs> you came up in my home. Shot my daughter, stripped me naked. Like, nah, dude, he take my gun. <laughs> take my gun. No, seriously. Fuck him. Shoot him. Shoot him now. <laughs> Is that enough money for therapy for all this? God damn. The Joker suggests that he and Batman are the way that they are because they both had one bad day. And then he reveals uh, that the way he remembers his uh, past, sometimes it's one way, sometimes it's another way. And that's kind of one of the things that we were talking about before is that, you know, as far as origin stories for the Joker goes, the killing joke might be it, or it might be complete nonsense that he just came up with one day. Um, the idea of the Joker not being able to remember his own past is an interesting one. And it kind of uh, links into another story, another Batman story called um, Batman Arkham Asylum, a serious house on serious earth, mm -hmm. where um, the staff at Arkham have now diagnosed the Joker as having not in fact insanity, but what they would consider to be super sanity, where he effectively creates his own, um, he creates a new personality for himself every day. So that's why you sometimes have like the Cesar Romero um, Joker, and then you sometimes have the you know the Jared Leto joke Joker, or you will have or I don't think his Joker counts though. I'm pretty sure everybody <laughs> across the board has been like, nope. Look, it's you know his scary. Joker counts, and his single is dropping on SoundCloud next week, and it's gonna be dope. 
No, it's fucking not. <laughs> it's like, what's his face? Jeremy Renner made a fucking album. And holy fuck, is it bad? It's just auto tune. It's just <laughs> auto tune. Then he paired the album with Jeep commercials. It's it's <laughs> terrible. It's like the worst thing ever. That probably is what started the event. Was Jeremy Renner's shitty album, <laughs> and then Jared Leto being like, "Hey." That's another thing my shitty ass can do to be relevant. Let's make music. <laughs> because uh, I haven't ruined enough things like Blade Runner and any movie I've been in that wasn't the scene of me getting the shit knocked out of in Fight Club. Wait, was he? Oh, Jared Leto. No, Jared Leto. Sorry, I thought you were still talking about Jeremy Renner. Is Jeremy no. Renner in Blade Runner? Look in the background. He's there somewhere. Yeah, I was distracted by the flashing neon lights. <laughs> I'm not a Jared Leto fan at all. His Joker was bad. And even when he was like, did this huge whiny interview of like, they cut out all my scenes and blah, blah, blah. And my Joker was amazing. I'm like, it probably was really fucking bad because yeah. most times if someone cut your scenes and the scenes you have, <laughs> people can usually tell, wow, this dude's going to be awesome. I wish I had more of this. Yeah. When I watched Suicide Squad once in theaters with the girl I was dating, which was a terrible, terrible mistake to do because that movie was so bad. It was such a bad movie. It's like, why well, watch it? And I remember going, man, the scenes with the Joker, man, I wish they had less of these. <laughs> these are so bad. Like, he is the worst portrayal of the Joker. It's like somebody told him, like, we want you to play a character that, you know, has been well established throughout, like, since like the 60s or whenever, you know, way back to Batman shows. And he's like, cool, can I get a bunch of stupid fucking tattoos on my face and just go for it? I'm like, no, dude, what the fuck? But did you read any of this? I think one time, didn't he cite um, Heath Ledger or didn't he dedicate his performance to Heath Ledger? Yeah, how fucking, like how fucking big of a mistake that was. I mean, so you're saying you're not going to be at Morbius on o opening night? No, not at all. That's going to be it's going to be terrible. It's very Leto. <laughs> at least they didn't pick Stuart Townsend to play another vampire. <laughs> like at least they didn't pick him. I'm what pretty, is Stuart Townsend doing these probably days? Probably fucking retired because he's terrible. Like yeah, Tom he... Cruise played a better Lestat, and that's saying Tom Cruise did something good. Like Tom Cruise. As bad as he was in that movie, was still millions of years better than. <laughs> I would watch a whole movie of just Tom Cruise thinking he really is Lestat. Like, you know how great that would be? He doesn't need to read the source material. Like, Anne Rice is going to be like, all right, that's canon, I guess. Fuck it. <laughs> Tom Cruise is Lestat. Like, here he is. He gave me a bunch of money and Scientology paid me off. This will be fun. I'm looking at, he actually, yeah, uh, Stuart Townsend has not worked in um, in Hollywood or kind of in any movie um, since 2017, 20, 2013 for movies. And then he was in like an episode of The Law and Order in 2017. Gross. Yeah. That's, that's what happens uh, if you're not a good actor and people find out. <laughs> I thought it would have stopped after like... Um, like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, because he was really bad in that. He was apparently uh, supposed to be originally in Thor. He was going to play Fandral, and then Fandral got replaced. So for good replaced as reason. Fandral. Yeah. For yeah. a good reason. They were like, who do we have cast as this character? Stuart Townsend. Fuck Stuart Townsend. <laughs> like, my daughter tried to get me to watch Queen of the Dam the other day. It was terrible. <laughs> It was terrible. Uh, I had to listen to Jonathan Davis write music. <laughs> Which the soundtrack was like the only thing that was good. Yeah, I I actually kind of like some of those songs. Yeah, the, the soundtrack was the only thing that was salvageable. I remember having the soundtrack before I saw the movie. And it, I was, you know, it came out when I was like a teenager around that time. And so I have already read all of Anne Rice's stuff because that's what you do, I guess. When you like, you know, dark things. I don't know. <laughs> you read well, all of Anne Rice. And then you realize halfway through reading some of them, Anne Rice shifts gears and it gets really weird for a while. Yeah, Anne <laughs> Rice has a, <laughs> had a pretty interesting shift into religious fiction for a while. Like she wrote like a whole bunch of like effectively like Jesus fan fiction books. 
Yeah. And uh, she's, yeah, I guess she's, uh, it's it's interesting. I, she's been trying to launch a, uh, she and, uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, but the guy who did uh, the Hannibal TV show. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, um, the fucking, the director? Or the yeah, guy? Brian Fuller. Brian Fuller. Uh, so she and Brian Fuller were, were trying to launch a Vampire Chronicle. So, like, the whole, like, her whole universe of them TV show, which I always thought would have been a really interesting <laughs> setup. Like, his, like, visual styling with that story, it's I think, would be perfect. And Darius back as Armand. He can do oh, it. That'd be great. <laughs> it's like everyone but Stuart Townsend. Even the guy that got to play Marius was more like Marius. <laughs> like it was funny you read the books and all of the background characters that are main characters in the like the fucking book all look like what they're supposed to look like i remember being like watching the movie like that's who that is that's who that is who the fuck is that and, uh, who the fuck was that ended up being Stuart townsend <laughs> but yeah just fucking uh man they really fucked that movie yeah yeah, just get everyone else but him. That's it. Just did you know him. that um, there are? Did you know that Roland S. Howard was in deleted scenes from that movie? What he was? Roland S. Howard and a group of other Australian musicians were a quote unquote vampire band uh, in the movie, and uh, yeah, so there are on oh, the cutting cool. room floor apparently Roland S. Howard, uh, yeah, the the Queen of the Damned. Uh, footage. Oh, I see. Yeah. The Excluded scenes of it. Yeah. <laughs> what? Why the fuck? They should have put him in the movie. It would have been way better. They should have got him to play Lestat. <laughs> it would have been way better. Uh, it would have been weirder, but it, it would definitely be better. It would have been super weird. <laughs> I don't remember this song on the soundtrack. No, there's a lot of stuff that was cut out of the soundtrack. Oh, so this is. That's really good. There's a yeah. There's like a whole apparently like a oh, whole version is. of the. Uh, it's a whole version of this entire deleted scene is better than anything in that movie. Like it really is. Like the song that they're fucking with is just. It's so good. Well, there's a whole version of the soundtrack that it has a, a different singer uh, because Jonathan Davis couldn't yeah. be. Uh, couldn't be on, like actually on the, the soundtrack. So there's a version of the soundtrack that has um, vocals from a dude called uh, Jeff Scott Soto, who I think was briefly in Sabotage, but had his was best known for his brief uh, his his brief period fronting uh, the band Christ the Conqueror, which was uh, the post Misfits project of Jerry Only. <laughs> This so even like, sounds like Roland S. Howard. Yeah, yeah. Like, what the fuck? Like, fuck those guys. Like, why would you cut that? Yeah. There's I'm so angry now. I'm so mad. <laughs> I'm mad I didn't know that, but I'm even more mad they would be like, hmm, we got this movie done. We got these awesome people to be in it. What scene should we cut? Obviously, nothing with Stuart Townsend. This guy's our money cow. <laughs> He's going to make us this money, money. Aaliyah, bright star. She's going to be great later on. Was not. I think she died during the making of that mm -hmm. movie. It was pretty fucked up. And then after all that, they decided to do her like tribute by like cutting out all the good stuff. Like that's, like, that's yeah. such a good, that, that song is great. It is the best part of the soundtrack. And I've never and I've never heard it before. So yeah, that movie is gonna be, end up being yeah. That movie has apparently like so much deleted and um, just kind of like interested, interesting removed and deleted scenes and songs and pieces of just background pieces in it. And just because it's a movie that no one cares about, like we're never gonna see. <laughs> it sucks. I want them to like. I want to do a petition to release it all. <laughs> release it all to the public and let us take release the, the Howard cut. Yeah, release the Howard cut. <laughs> Just show up at the door. Remember that movie you did in two thousand and fucking three? Release the Howard cut. Yeah, 
That should be the, uh, the the official, if, if we do like an official hashtag for this show, rather than like, welcome to ha Frankenstein House, we should just be hashtag release the Howard Cup. <laughs> we're going to go on a mission to, uh, you know, through this show, we're going to try to get the film Queen of the Damned to release the <laughs> Roland S. Howard Cup. <laughs> We'll petition. We'll go to their houses. I'm sure they they're probably pretty accessible because I'm sure everyone that made that movie is fired. <laughs> so but, uh, we got to fight the studio on this. We gotta, we, we gotta, gotta, you know, they got it somewhere. They got some. They they got some vault somewhere. It's sitting in <laughs> some dude's fucking basement. Probably Stuart Townsend's fucking basement. Oh, probably he's got some castle in Ireland that he's just like sitting in. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh. <laughs> So, uh, Batman reveals to Joker that Gordon is fine. It actually takes more than one just bad, one bad day to make some people crack. Uh, they end up fighting. Um, Joker attempts to stab him, but Batman throws him through the wall of the uh, funhouse. Uh, Joker pulls a gun on Batman and tries to fire it, but realizes too late that it's actually a trick gun with a flag that goes bang. So, his uh, little uh, cute little... Scheme there doesn't really work out for him. He defeated. Yeah, Good. Not well at all. Did not work out. <laughs> defeated. Uh, Batman. Uh, Joker tells Batman uh, a joke. The joke was the uh, the one about uh, the two men trying to escape from the insane asylum with the flashlight. Well, you gotta tell the joke now, though. You can't just like oh, reference it. You gotta like tell the joke. You gotta. <laughs> You gotta set it up. You gotta get that face paint on and just really go for it. I don't think the face get, paint is happening. You get into the Joker moment. Hold on. Let me let me see if I can pull this up on Comicsology and I'll uh, I'll see if I can do my mock Hamill impression. Uh, who's here? And, uh, see, there were two guys in a lunatic asylum. <laughs> and one, night, one night, they decide they don't like living in an asylum anymore. They're going to escape. And so, so, like, they get up onto the roof, and there, just across the narrow gap, they see the rooftops of the town stretching away in the moonlight, stretching away to freedom. Now, first, no, the first guy, he jumps right across, no problem, but his friend, his friend didn't make the leap, you see. You see, he's afraid of falling. And then the first guy, he has an idea. He says, hey, I have my flashlight with me. I'll shine it across the gap between the buildings. You can walk across the beam and join me. But the second guy, he just shakes his head. He says, what do you think I am, crazy? You turn it off when I was halfway across. <laughs> uh, so Batman and the Joker uh, begin. Well, the Joker begins laughing, and then suddenly that man gets caught up. Uh, so they are laughing together. Batman grabs the Joker as they're laughing. Ha 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 ha! And then we kind of just fade to uh, the falling rain, which I believe the comic started off with. So, I'm going to bring something up here. There's another comic book writer I quite like a lot called Grant Morrison. He was on Kevin Smith's podcast, Fat Man on Batman, where he basically said his interpretation of the ending of that, especially knowing that it was supposed to be a uh, non-continuity story, was that the Batman kills the Joker there. I remember seeing that, too. Okay. Yeah. Did you do you, like? Does that make sense to you? Like, do do you do you think that's the case? I kind of because I mean, if you see the comic, you just see um, Batman continuing to laugh. Uh, you see him laughing, like the Joker's laughing, 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 yeah. and then the second to last panel, he just stops, and then it goes into just rain. And so it's to me, it looks like the Joker, you know got his neck snapped or something and now isn't laughing anymore. Yeah. I think like outside of continuity, that makes sense inside of continuity. It doesn't obviously we see the Joker come back again. Um, mm -hmm. But the whole, I don't know. Um, 
Brian Bolland did an interview where somebody asked him about it and he was like, there was nothing in the script about that. And if, you know, if, if you got that interpretation from my art, I apologize. That's not what I was trying to do there. Ooh, I was trying to be them. <laughs> it was trying to be them laughing together and then just have it quietly fade out into the falling rain. Uh, just to, to show you the example, just to show you sort of the futility of Batman's attempts to reach out to this maniac. And um, that's our story. <laughs> and I mean, I mean, I've seen a lot of the interpretations of people like, well, obviously you kill Joker because, you know, the laughing stops and it just fades into rain and stuff. And I mean, if it was supposed to be just a one off, I mean, I think it would complete the story more if he killed Joker. Because I mean, the whole point is he went to go see Joker like, hey, this is going to no matter what, this is going to go on forever until one of us kills each other there's got to be a way out of this, you know, and then Joker's counterpoint of, you know, everyone's, you know, one, one bad day away from going insane, from turning into just a deranged fucking villain, which, you know, was proven in the story, you know, that's obviously not the case. You tried it with Jim Gordon. It didn't happen to him. Batman tells him, well, it was only you that went insane, you know, and Batman, you know, had a similar life thing happen, you know, his parents were killed shit happens and he had a bad day became batman so i think uh, for the whole uh just what how it's supposed to be a one-off it does make more sense for you know they can keep that mystery there but it does feel like you know he did kill joker so yeah yeah and uh so the killing joke is uh kind of i mean it's in the name the killing joke i mean come on <laughs> so the joke and that's an interesting point. So Jazz from uh, from the band Killing Joke is fairly convinced that they named the story after the band uh, to the point where he believes that the actual like uh, portrayal of the Joker like visually was based off of him. Oh um, yeah, let me uh, let me see if I can pull up a, a picture of him. <laughs> Photos of Jazz back in '88. Yeah. So Jazz Coleman is a very weird dude. Um, both very like weird great. looking, very weird as a human being. Uh, let me, yeah, let me share screen here. Stuff. Load. Unfortunately, when I'm streaming, uh, everything is really slow on this computer. So yeah, he uh, has a tendency to like disappear sometimes. Apparently, like he thought the world was going to end in the early '90s, so he and a bunch of his friends moved to Iceland, where they were going to like start an intentional community and you know wait out the apocalypse. Because that's what uh, people do. Yeah. So I, while I'm not entirely convinced, it's true. I can sort of see it if you want to compare, like, the look of, you know, the way his, uh, the way some of the wrinkles of his face and, you know, his nose and everything, the way it compares to the, the uh, sort of the Brian Bolland picture, uh, just the portrayal of the Joker, I can honestly kind of see what he's saying there. It is kind of curious that a guy with, you know, Those same indentations in his face, the same kind of nose. Um, it is sort of interesting that those made it over to um, a comic book called The Killing Joke completely coincidentally. That's a really interesting kind of thing. If it is like, if it is a coincidence, it's a hell of a coincidence because, like, he, like, I believe it. Like, <laughs> I really do I mean, believe yeah, it. Yeah, it does. It, it really looks a lot like him. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to talk about, uh, first of all, the different versions of this. <laughs> and then um, and then we'll talk about uh, a little bit about how this kind of affected the, uh, the world of comics and Alan Moore's uh, general opinion about the book. Um, the aforementioned Casper the Friendly Ghost with a basket full of uh, human eyeballs. <laughs> um, so, 
This is, uh, so it got recolored in 1988. Uh, sorry, not, not, it, it was originally colored in 1988 and it was recolored in 2008 when Brian Mullen got the original art back and they did a, a you know, 20th anniversary version of it. Uh, the actual like 2008 um, or the original 1988 coloring is very different from uh, the modern one we see now. So uh, I'll show you these. this first comparison here. Oh. So on the left you will see it is extremely of its time. Oh yeah. It's God damn. Very uh, like very bright, very um, stark uh, and kind of psychedelic color scheme. Um, and on the right is the modern one, which is a lot more realistic. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and say a very controversial thing. I've said it a few times online, but um, I kind of hate modern recolorings of old comics. I feel like a lot of the charm and energy gets sucked out of it. And while well, I know- Here comes the hate mail. I mean, that's fine. I mean, while the modern <laughs> one is, the modern one is, I mean, it's by the original artist, by Brian Ballin. It's what he yeah. envisioned when he was drawing it. It's what he wants he to do. He just wasn't like. a, really a colorist at that point, I believe. He, or I don't know what the deal was. I just know that he wasn't doing the coloring for this. Yeah. In the 80s, yeah, definitely not. And the, especially in the, the 80s, there was, I think, only 64 colors you could actually reproduce on a printing press, where in the modern era, you can sort of do anything. Um, I do like how the modern colors bring out the uh, the realism of his art. I do think it makes it a little stiff, though. Like I think yeah. the, the the older the older coloring style gives a life and an energy to it that I think the modern one doesn't have. Um, and I'm uh, I'm borrowing this from a blog called Jim Smash Jim Smash .blogspot .com that did a lot of different comparisons. I think if we go into, um, I think it also did some other comparisons like the modern Sandman um, yeah. reprints of new coloring. The, you know, if we do Sandman or do some of Sandman arts, we'll talk about that. Yeah, here's another couple pages. Here is the uh, the Joker reveal on the left hand side, um, and then uh, the the modern one on the right. Um, the idea of the flashbacks being find, in black and white. Now with, you can find all the posers because the ones that get that Joker, the bottom frame Joker tattooed on them. Yeah. Now, do they have it in the badass eighties <laughs> purple, or do they have it kind of black and white? Because the ones yeah. that are doing the modern ones, you call those fuckers out right now. Be like, I thought you're a fan, man. <laughs> Apparently, you just bought this on Comicology for like eleven fucking dollars, and was like, I don't know who this fucking dude is, but he's getting tattooed on me. <laughs> So yeah, um, the one thing uh, one thing I did like about the modern coloring is this uh, the thing in the right of um, the flashbacks being in um, black and white or sepia tones with occasional splashes of color, like with the red hood, like the red helmet for the red hood and his green hair. Yeah, um, that is something that you didn't really have much of in the original. I think the original had maybe like more of a yellow tint things, but it was a lot more a lot brighter color. Um, the color, uh, it was a lot more stark and a lot more psychedelic uh, than the ones in the modern recolor, which it's that's interesting. I, I, I kind of like that change, but I didn't really like you can see here, everything looks more realistic because of the mm -hmm. way it's colored. I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure I like it so much. <laughs> uh, I've got such like a weird affinity for these, like pre pre photoshop era coloring schemes that i really like them there's a an artist i really like um, um called ed, ed piscor who he colors everything on photoshop but he built himself a palette based entirely off of only the colors that were available in the 80s through the mid 90s oh. so he has this like color palette that's entirely based off of that and all of his all of his artwork looks very old school so it's 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 interesting and it's cool and it's uh i don't know i just there's so there's a charm to these to this old 
old school, old style uh, coloring that you just don't see anymore. Uh, which is, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I don't know. Well, um, yeah, it's, you, kind of, it's almost like uh, like music and it's very nerdy stuff. Like the difference between like Pro Tools and a lot of other um, DAWs and stuff. I can always, always tell when something's Pro Tools versus yeah. anything else because, it, you know, it's like with the modern like artwork stuff, it just has this like, uh, this, this look, this uniform, like look and sound of like, this is the standard right here. And I'm like, you know, the shit that wasn't the standard is always the coolest to me, I guess. Like, I yeah. still, I mean, seeing the original artwork, yeah, I can see like how artistically it is cool to have the sepia toned with a little bit of color for the flashbacks, and that's a great touch. A lot of the other parts of that, the book with the older color scheme, just looks phenomenal. I, I like that a lot. Yeah, it's one of those things. It's like, I got to look at it. It's like, this is a hell of an artistic accomplishment. I just like the old one more. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, I, it, it's weird to say that. It's like, I know this is better, but it's not mm -hmm. what I like. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I guess, I mean, there's some movies like that. Like, like I, I know, but, or like, you know, I guess like, um, oh, you know what would be a good example? Like, did you see the new Suspiria? Not yet, no. I would I've been, say I've been meaning to, but at the same time, I I gotta watch the old Suspiria again because I watched yep. it recently before the I, new one came out, and I'm like, such a great fucking film. And then I heard the new one's coming out, and I'm like, well, shit, <laughs> is it gonna be a good film or is it? So I would say yeah. on every technical level, on every like actual like filmmaking and editing and special effects and lighting and um music like every piece of it is actually like technically speaking better but the, the old one is better because it is it, it is entirely itself like it, it's better yeah. because it's not perfect because it's because it doesn't have all it, it is it isn't as refined it isn't, it isn't as um uh, as well done there's you know the, this whole thing like you know, you can draw a perfect human being, but maybe like may maybe a cartoon looks better to people because it has more energy and it has more um, more life in it. It has you know there's there's something about um or uh, there's uh, what was his name uh, Eric Larson. There's a he was one of the image founders and he had a he had a character called Savage Dragon, but he had this quote which was which I I just heard on a, a live stream by. Uh, a YouTube channel called Cartoonist Kayfabe recently, and he said, "Like style is everything you do wrong." Mm -hmm. And I think that might be what I like about this uh, is like I I feel like the one on the left hand side has a style that resonates with me more. Anyway, I definitely agree with that. I've always I've always liked things that you know are done differently, or maybe not as well, or you know, isn't, you know, all the stuff that goes against the grain. It's all the things that, you know, got me into punk and post-punk and other other stuff, music growing up was just, wow, this doesn't sound as polished as, you know, as these guys have been around forever. Like, or this isn't, you know, this artwork here, you know, they have, you know, this weird, unique style that other people may look at and go, that looks like random horse shit. And I'm like, <laughs> cool, dude. So, like, everyone likes what they like, but, I mean, I just, you yeah. know, like polish you are. I don't know. Sometimes the better it is. But yeah, I, mean, I mean, if someone's been listening to Mozart their entire life, they're not going to necessarily get Gang of Four, and vice versa. But uh, there's 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 qualities to both things. <laughs> there is. I mean, I love Gang of Four. Yeah, just such a unique guitar style that yeah. probably just only works in Gang of Four. It's yeah, just, it's, it's great. It's just like when I used, you know when I'd um, do comparisons with like vocalist and I thought people were like terrible vocalists of like you know Kirk Cobain, Trent Reznor and they're like no they're not the great like no that's the thing is they weren't but they wrote music that went along with it to make them sound a lot better I mean Trent became better as the years went on but I mean that yeah. dude's not a vocalist <laughs> like yeah. Kirk Cobain not a vocalist but like the music they wrote was crafted enough to kind of like you know they made art around it and elevated it so yeah you Trent is, is interesting for um, also like because all the Nine Inch Nails albums, especially the early ones, had 
technically speaking, utterly atrocious guitar tones. Like to a certain point where like no. a lot of his guitar stuff.